Prime Minister Philip Davis urging the Caribbean to connect on the goal of upgrading telecommunications offerings and availability in the interest of regional progress. He was addressing Canto's 37th annual conference and trade show in Miami, the first in-person event since the COVID-19 pandemic, when he forecast what the region's telecoms landscape could look like. I believe that we have enormous potential in the region to take advantage of the digital revolution. We have a unique opportunity to create smart cities, complete with 5G technology, expanded access to always on connectivity and cashless ecosystems. We can strengthen our democracies and increase trust between governments and the people if we use technology to, to substantially improve the delivery of government services. And we can be bold and we can be brave in how we achieve this. The Prime Minister lamenting that regional telecoms providers have maintained status quo underfunded operations, depriving the region's people of access to the latest technology and begging some key questions about competition. But the relatively small size of our individual markets is one of the factors that has historically given rise to a number of protectionist practices in various jurisdictions. Are we now at the moment when we need to make adjustments to encourage more competition into the space? Will greater market forces lead to better services and better products for our people? The Prime Minister also telling Canto delegates that the Bahamas has renewed its commitment to leading the regional charge on telecommunications as it seeks its seat at the international table of communications progress. And now I am pleased to announce that the government of the Bahamas will be putting forward a candidate for the election as the director of ITU's Telecommunication Development Bureau. EDT is the arm of the ITU that focuses on bringing assistance to developing, and it is well past time that the Caribbean and small island developing states takes its place in ITU and the BT, BDT's leadership. Keeping you in the know, this is OPM Press Now. colleagues and those joining us via the stream, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the Office of the Prime Minister's weekly press briefing. As always, we have an exciting briefing planned for you, so I'm going to invite Press Secretary Clint Watson to come and introduce our speakers today. Good morning. Thank you, Jillian. Good morning, colleagues, and to all of you joining us live uh, this morning by various streams. We're so happy to have all of you for another week. We, we are here to update you on the progress of the Davis administration, uh, what we're doing, how we're making it happen, and take your questions that you may have this morning. Uh, there's a couple of things that obviously has been uh, center stage in the news, and obviously would be in Exuma, the oil spill, and so we're going to give you the latest update on that first thing this morning. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Bahamas Technical and Vocational Institute. We're so happy to have the interim president here to talk about a new initiative. Uh, and then we're going to talk to, about a very important thing that we believe is also important for you uh, as, uh, in the family, which is National Family Week. We'll talk a bit about that and then take your questions. I have some information to pass on to you from the uh, DRA as well. And then, of course, we'll take whatever questions you may have. So let's just jump right into it. And coming to give us the update is the director of the Department of Environmental Protection and Planning, Dr. Rihanna Neely Murphy, on the latest with the Exoma spill. Dr. Neely. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Uh, good morning, everybody. So a diesel spill occurred during, the, during a BPL refueling exercise sometime during the evening hours on July 19th, 2022, near the harbor in Georgetown, Exuma. A 400-foot hose was used during the refueling exercise, and at some point during the exercise, the hose, was, the hose broke. Uh, 
police. We have police on scene and environmental officers from the Department of Environmental Planning and Protection as, as well as the Department of Environmental Health Services conducting an investigation and all parties are cooperating with the officials. BPL was expecting approximately 115,000 gallons of, of diesel fuel. They received 79,000 gallons of fuel. That leaves 36,000 accounted for. We suspect it is in the marine environment. From the officers left here on Wednesday, late Wednesday morning, work at the site continued almost around the clock. I have Mr. Anthony Ryan here with me, um, public analyst, who was in charge of the site for the first two days um, where work continued, I think, until Thursday morning in about one o'clock, and then they took a break and resumed about 5 a.m. on Thursday morning. So work continued from that time until about 8 p.m. last night, where the diesel on the site was considered to be about 95% removed, and removal activities continue this morning. I sent the press secretary a video that we, so that we can see where we are um, as of about 9.30 this morning. Okay, thank you very much. So you can see that much of the fuel, most of the fuel has been removed. There is still active removal going on in the, in the corner there, and we expect that that should be completed by end of day today. Um, sand is also being removed from the site. Uh, we had um, some boreholes placed last night to determine if and where we had diesel um, that would have, have breached the sand, gone under the sand. We did find diesel, so we're gonna start the activity of removing the sand from the site as well. Um, and this, that is, of, of course, as a result of the, of the wave action. So today, as I said, most of the product has been actively removed and the beach is looking um, closer to normal than it did on Wednesday. It's not back to normal, but progress is being made and the beach is going to remain closed until August 10th. Um, where we would conduct another assessment to determine whether or not it is safe for the public's use. Um, this is now the beginning. We're getting into the beginning of the remediation work and the monitoring work, which we expect to continue for a few months into a year. Um, we taking questions? Okay. So that is where we are. I will take a few questions. Uh, things we found out with cost is still, our clients going to be issued from Sun Oil. So we're looking into the government's options with respect to damages and liability. And once those investigations have been complete, then we will, the advice will be to pursue damages, yes. What are some of the options you're looking at now? So according to the legislation, um, there, will be, there are options for just illegal discharge. So there, there are fines. The Sun Oil um, and the companies involved would have to pay for any and all remediation activities that the government would have paid for up until this point and those moving into the future. Um, so those would be court matters. Um, these, at this time, I think the AG is here, but these are not arrestable offenses, not at this point. Um, so we will be looking to go to court. Okay, how, how much is the, are the damages looking at right now? We are still in the um, initial phases of the assessment, so I cannot give you, I w wouldn't want to be reckless and give you any kind of a number at this point. But as soon as numbers become available, we will advise. Um, one yes, ma'am. Um, in situations like these, we mediated. Mediated? Mitigated. Mitigated. Okay, so uh, practically, if you are refueling, um, you have these, these these refueling activities, at any point in time, accidents can happen. Um, this is the reason why you have an oil spill plan. We do have an oil spill plan that was approved by the cabinet. Um, we took quick, act, quick, quick action on Wednesday to get officers there as, as soon as we realized what happened. And so we have boots on the ground to mitigate the impacts. But as long as you're using fossil fuel and there's transfer of fuel, there is an option or the opportunity for accidents to happen. So this is the reality that we live in. Um, would you be able to speak to the long-term effects that may possible to like the ecosystem and the beach itself? 
Okay, so from um, the initial assessments, it is sandy bottom, but we know that our sands act as substrate for micro and, and macro um, organisms that are a little bit difficult to see crabs. We can see crabs living in the sand. And so we expect that those will have a lot of impact. The sand, of course, will have to be removed and treated, if not treated, um, disposed of at the landfill or at another facility. We didn't, um, we haven't noticed any coral reef, any seagrass, or anything of that nature in the area. We have not been able to, I haven't gotten any reports yet of any bird life or mammals that would have been impacted. So in that regard, we are a bit lucky that this was a very small cove, um, that the wave action was able to contain it in that area, and we were able to use the, the um, oil spill technology to continue to contain it and, and have um, as little um, negative impact on the environment as, as a diesel spill could, could possibly have. No problem. Any other questions? Okay, great. All right, thank you. And of course, we will continue to monitor and give you any updates if anything changes um, as we move along. But we're happy, I don't know how you felt when you saw that video, to see a big difference in what we saw a few days ago, uh, which shows the, the quick response and effort uh, of those involved in, in mitigating this, this unfortunate circumstance. So thank you to the director and all of the agencies involved in their response quickly uh, in this regard. I want to move on. Uh, Dr. Linda Davis, the interim president of the Bahamas Technical and Vocational Institute, is here. Uh, and then she's going to talk to you about something called Smart Start Initiative. It's a very important initiative that I think that uh, all of you listening should take uh, full advantage of and listen to. I'm going to invite Dr. Linda Davis to come now and talk to us about that. I may not need notes, but I, you know, I, <laughs> there's something about the comfort of having those in front of you as you, um, and of course it's not going to cooperate, but so that means I go without notes. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Watson. So good to see you, um, press. Um, it is really my pleasure this morning to speak to you about an initiative that we at BTVI and indeed the Ministry of Education and technical and vocational um, training feel is a game changer. It is a game changer because it provides a pathway and an avenue for students who dropped out of visibility in terms of access to educational opportunities. We're talking about those students who disengage from the virtual environment as we try to navigate our way through the pandemic. From 2020 to present, uh, they are speculating that there are some 7,000 students from across the educational public service, public sector, who have disappeared, who have gone into informal work environments, who have uh, done whatever they could to find their way. And so uh, BTVI, as a result of representation, on the Mis Minister of Education and Technical and Vocational Learning Recovery Initiative Task Force created some pathways, and we are calling those pathways safe and, well, smart start at BTVI. These programs provide what we consider a trades pathway into a workforce readiness um, um, preparation. Students have an opportunity to look at trades in the construction and me mechanical area. They have an opportunity to look at trades in beauty. They have an opportunity to look at trades in fashion. And of course, we are so, so, so delighted about the possibilities as they navigate those pathways. And so we uh, are desirous of any assistance that we can get from the public to encourage those students to visit B BTVI, to go onto our website, smartstart at btvi.edu.bs. And we are tabbing it, we are dubbing it, hashtag don't count us out, because we believe that those students have an opportunity to find a passion, to ignite a fire, 
as they find their way into the opportunity to get baseline, entry-level technical skills in the trade sector. Um, we are uh, delighted to advise that the uh, government is providing tuition waiver or grants. There is no cost from the point of application to completion. One of the really exciting dimensions of the program is a 30-hour attachment to industry or business. Those 30 hours allow the students to work under the oversight of a master technician so that they can see a window into the various trades. They have an opportunity perhaps to explore an area firsthand that they may not have necessarily done so in the past. Finally, we are looking for a special kind of educator, a special teacher who may be prepared to work with this initiative. Of course, there's a stipend, nothing is free in life. And so there's an opportunity for us to really pair uh, the uh, special educator to work with these groups of, of students in a very intimate and direct way. And we are not just Nassau-centric about this opportunity. We are looking throughout the family of islands, connecting with coordinators, district superintendents, to assist us in this rollout. Grand Bahama is, of course, way ahead of us. They had a soft launch, and they have approximately 140 students already begun. And so we're excited to learn from some of the experiences and lessons that Grand Bahama will have to share with us as we roll out. It is a 12-week program, and the beauty of these customized programs that are offered by BTVI is that as soon as we get a cohort, 25 or more, we roll it out. And we continue to roll it out until such time as we've made a difference because we are about exploring or providing opportunities for students to explore possibilities through the trades. We say at BTVI, learn a trade and earn a living. And so with that, Press Secretary, I believe I've wrapped without notes. Thank you. And so if I've left out anything, I have a disclaimer. You will ask the question that will certainly bring it back to memory very quickly. Questions? Um, since this program was launched, I think it was on Monday? Yes, officially right, launched. Right, yes. Right, yes, on Monday in the province. Um, persons have asked me, do those persons, um, you said volunteers, but do they have to be teacher certified? We want them to have some experience, some pedagogy. It's important now. These are a special class of, of, of students. We don't want to send them into the traditional environment. We want to send them into an environment where the person who is facilitating the learning is knowledgeable, is, can engage in pedagogy. And so we will look at, on a case-by-case -case basis, the um, trades person likely is not teacher trained but has to have the ability to convey the content and to be able to explain to the student how basic skills are, are, are conveyed. And so we have a program. It is a program which is approved by NACOB. We are registered with NACOB. And so we have to make sure that we follow the content as laid out in the courses. So we will look on a case-by-case -case basis in the, in, in the instances. And volunteering is key to this country. We don't do enough of it. And so we are hoping that businesses and industries will step up. But the teacher, the facilitator, we'll look at that on a one-by-one on a -one basis. Well, I say that too, because you know, sometimes you have people who may not be um, certified, but they're grandfathered and grandmothered. Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I, I recall very much, although most of the persons with whom I would have been um, exposed in my early, early days were perhaps um, what we used to call, I'll date myself by using this word, but monitors, those who would have worked in a school system and perhaps learned the craft by being engaged. 
And so um, it may be, because we are working with the urban renewal centers, it may be that we have to pair such an individual with a qualified uh, teacher. But we want to make sure that the quality is abs absolutely um, high, the integrity of the program is not compromised. And so whatever we, we can do to support that, we certainly will look into the possibility. Uh, how much is the program costing our BTVI? Sorry? How much is the program costing BTVI? Well, it, like I said, it is being covered um, by a grant uh, from the gov government, from the Ministry of Education um, and Technical and Vocational Training. The programs at, at BTVI really are, are um, let, shall I say, are generous in terms of um, what we deliver as service. Um, um, I, I don't know if I, it all depends on how, we, how many students we're able to roll, roll out um, in terms of the costing and the final analysis, but there's no cost to the student. We have um, the equivalent of what is the um, tuition grant, which allows the students um, cost, and therefore for us to be able to pay the facilitator and our overhead is covered. Well, we're going to keep on pushing, and I said to the minister, if I need to come back to her, I'll come back to her. But right now, we're sitting fairly comfortably. It all depends on how many um, students we can encourage to come forward. Um, we want to make sure that we make a dent in that 7,000. Uh, we think it is important to do that. The minister believes in the program, and certainly, um, if it comes to the point that we need to go back, we'll go back. But we're sitting fairly um, well now. Um, I am not able to give a good assessment of what the portal looks like in terms of applications. But that we were able to get 140 in Grand Bahama is a good sign. Every time we speak to the Family Island um, um, potential coordinators, the sense is that there is interest. We are fielding questions. Um, through telephone communications and through um, the email address especially set up. And so we will continue to monitor and perhaps at another time uh, Mr. Watson will invite me back for an update. The, the, um, the government has waived the program for students, but there still is a cost associated. Oh yes. So how much has been set aside? <coughs> You always push for that kind uh, kind of question. I'm not sure if I'm at liberty to, to say the exact amount, but there is sufficient funding available, and if I find out that I can give that um, exact amount, I will certainly convey that to Mr. Mr. Watson. I don't think the exact amount. You'll estimate. <laughs> 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 um, I would say again, let me... Let me clear that before I give you the exact amount, but it is, um, I think, a generous amount to allow us to do what we need um, to make a dent. Um, um, the minister is passionate about this program, and every time I have had an issue, I have reached back out through the permanent secretary to get uh, what is required to keep us moving forward. Uh, Dr. Davis, I know your predecessor talked about implementing some sort of uh, career-oriented short courses program. Is that still ongoing at BTVI? Oh yes, that never, in fact, that, that, that happened even before my predecessor came on board. Um, BTVI has always um, offered upskill, upskilling um, short courses, what we call professional development courses, uh, where students um, uh, younger students, um, mid-career, retired persons could do um, short-term courses anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. They don't need to do a full program at BTVI. And in fact, we partner with works to do licensure programs such as single phase, three phase, um, journeyman plumbing. Uh, those are programs that have always existed at BTVI. What I'd like to do is to push the envelope even further to allow persons to be able to audit a course in our regular program because we do have um, um, interest being expressed about some persons. I don't want to do the, the whole program, they say, but I'm interested in doing um, the Cisco certification um, in IT, for example, and those opportunities through digital badges are already available. 
And so we have been in that space for a while, and there's no way we're going to get out of it. Is the audit the courses? Audit. What do you so, mean by that? So audit, when you audit a course, you, um, you take a course out of a program, um, um, but you don't take it for credit. You're just interested in refreshing um, your skills, your knowledge, your um, understanding in an area. Perhaps you've been away for, for a while, or you just, you just have, a, have an interest. And so you join a class along with students who are taking it for credit, but you don't have to, you're just doing it because of the interest refresh, and you're not necessarily doing it for a grade or a credit. So that's an option that we're, we're pursuing. Many um, institutions um, follow that route as, as an option or a possibility. How is the apprenticeship program going to of students? Um, for this Smart Start initiative? Um, because you have um, some friends. Well, we, we brag at BTVI. Um, um, we have an internship component, and up to 90 plus of our students who go through our regular programs do an internship as a requirement. Uh, we believe that uh, internships, externships, and apprentice opportunities in the trades are absolutely critical. Uh, we believe it's important for us to be in, in touch with industry to ensure that our content, our skills are current. Um, and so we have what we call a, a, um, a program advisory um, committee that informs uh, curriculum across the board. Um, on those committees, we have industry and business partners that say, hey, um, you need to upgrade in in the content area X or Y. Um, why don't you consider including uh, something else that is not there? Um, um, this particular strand or content is no longer relevant. Bring it into the current realm. So those kinds uh, of contacts um, from internships, externships, apprentice, uh, apprenticeships are absolutely critical if we are going to continue to meet the mark in terms of producing graduates that are ready for the workforce. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you, Dr. Davis. You're going to have me back, right? Definitely will. <laughs> Definitely it. will. Thank you. Uh, we, we, one of the things that we're doing in the administration is, of course, a, a, vi a vigorous program uh, to update uh, software in the government and digitalization and making access uh, for the internet, all of that is very important. Uh, Parliamentary Secretary Wade Watson has been tasked with that uh, particular assignment in the Ministry of Economic Affairs, and he's coming to give us an update on an announcement on a new initiative that government will be introducing uh, that you'll be quite delighted to hear. And so I'm gonna invite Parliamentary Secretary Wade Watson to come and, and make that announcement now. Um, good morning, and thank you, uh, Mr. Watson. Morning to my colleagues and to you, the members of the media gathered here today. I feel good about the news that I'm about to announce, and I'm excited to share this news with you. We have seen, particularly in the last two years, the need to, for internet access in areas of our lives, particularly the areas associated with those persons responsible and the need of the access to, to the internet. The government of the Bahamas, is, the Bahamas acknowledges that the internet is no longer a luxury, but rather a utility, a staple that must have to, that most of us have to function in a modern society. The government also realizes that many homes have had to go without the internet access due to financial constraints and in a time when it was greatly needed, especially during the pandemic. Others have to, had to make other sacrifices in order to acquire internet access and services at the expense of negligible and reducing revenue income. As outlined in our Blueprint for Change, the government of the Bahamas is committed to the digital transformation and, of course, further development of our ICT sector. 
Therefore, today, we are proud to announce an initiative dubbed Bahamas Park Connects that is aimed at providing free internet access to our islands, communities, and neighborhoods beginning on the 1st of August, 2022. The government of the Bahamas through the Office of the Prime Minister and the Ministry of Economic Affairs in particular is nearing the end of the installation process to provide free Wi-Fi access in at least one park in every constituency throughout the Bahamas, especially in the more densely populated areas. Uh, we are hopeful that through the provision of free Wi-Fi in the parks, mothers, fathers, students, business owners, and even travelers, and many others who need access to the internet will find this convenient and available for them to use. The internet is undeniably um, holds the fountain of information. Uh, we believe that information is key, and access to information is extremely important. We also understand and appreciate that in many cases, the ability to afford um, this access is also important and we, the government would like to provide that type of service to our citizenry as much as possible. It has proven to be a space that people can connect with other people, seek and find employment, learn new skills, earn degrees and certifications, and receive government services. The internet helps others to generate wealth through business, or the use of gifts and talents as influencers, bloggers, and vloggers. The government wants to provide you with the opportunities necessary to participate in the educational as well as the economic activities available online. We want to bridge the, the, the digital divide across our archipelagic nation. Uh, we want to create a strong culture of innovation. The government is wholeheartedly committed itself to removing any hindrance citizens may be confronted with when needing to do business online. Free internet in the park throughout the, throughout the islands of the Bahamas will equally afford all Bahamians the opportunity to receive the seamless delivery of electronic services. And you, you folks be quite aware of the migratory solution that the government launched some time ago. Yes, especially those services provided by the government, uh, we would like to make certain that those services are available and you can access it through the uh, Bahamas Parks Connects and free Wi-Fi in the park. We mark this as a move in the right direction, but there will be other initiative launch after this particular, initi this, this particular initi initiative, which will clearly show that we are prioritizing e-government and the provision of government services electronically. Uh, we want to be able to outfit not one, but a large number of parks where cost-free and safe internet access will be readily available. And it's certainly evident that we are in the progress within the government to working towards creating a digital society, or what we refer to in some cases, a smart city, or using smart technology, using ambiguous um, connectivity. The, the plan for the rollout, um, the free Wi-Fi rollout, again, is an archipelagic project, is made possible through the coordination and collaborative efforts of the Bahamas Parks and Public Beaches Authority. Again, the Ministry of Economic Affairs is the driving ministry behind this particular project, but we partner along with Bahamas Parks and Public Beaches Authority, because in this particular instance, we're using their facility. Uh, you, and they will be responsible for the provision of, of park wardens and also design and maintain uh, maintenance of a comfortable environment within the park so that our users could feel comfortable, safe, and uh, secure. Cable Bahamas, as well as Bahamas Telecommunications Company, are also jointly partnering with us, and, uh, as well as the Bahamas Power and Light Company, to ensure that we are able to provide um, internet services. Uh, strict usage policies, um, will be enforced on all parks. Again, we will make certain that we have the necessary software in place to ensure that our users use what we call in ICT uh, productive sites. So therefore, you know, not too much Walmart shopping and, and that other stuff, but 
uh, we want to make certain that we use the service for productivity and product, uh, productive means. Residents of New Baikid Island, you are set to be the first of the launching part of this particular initiative. Um, from the island that holds the uh, rich heritage and history, the Right Honorable uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Mr. Davis, will usher in the new, this particular new initiative that will bring community development and ultimately further national development. This launch is expected to, as I indicated previously, to, to happen on the 1st of August, and indeed is the beginning of what we refer to as a new day. Uh, we will continue to take advantage of all the healthy partnerships that we have uh, with the public and the private sectors to find more ways to bolster the access that citizens will require uh, through this free Wi-Fi in the parks project. We plan to offer digital learning opportunities, and I, um, Dr. Davis spoke about it um, early in her presentation, but it's our plan to continue to offer as, as much of these projects to ensure um, that we can engage our citizens and give, equip our citizens with the technology needed in order to advance themselves in whichever direction they would like to advance. Smartphones and smart devices are commonplace nowadays, but we cannot afford to assume that everyone has one, so therefore the issue of affordability. And in our conference with Canto this week, we had a major discussion with some of the major providers to see how best we can, we can provide the devices that are necessary at a low cost um, to our citizenry. There are still a ways away to, to go further re and, and remove what we consider the barriers to access, and but we will get there as a country because we will not stop until it is done. Internet has been available in the, Car in the Caribbean for more than, or for over 20 years. Um, it, is, it is simply the time now to put uh, a moratorium and the removal of the limitations to the adoption and the use of internet by behemoths. The digital revolution belongs to all of us and we all have a right to participate in it. The government is paving the way and narrowing the digital divide according to uh, international requirements. There's a long list of people that we can thank in the planning process, design and implementation of what we, this project, what we call Park Connects. There's even a longer list of people waiting on the other side as recipients of this particular initiative. Uh, we would like to thank all of you. We'd like to thank the media today for, for, for being a part of this particular launch. And the door is open for any new opportunities um, that may be presented. And we look forward for you to walk in and, assist, and be assisted where necessary. Thank you very much. Any questions? Just for clarity, so you're saying our users of the public um, access internet, their activity will be monitored? Not monitored, but will be restricted to certain sites that you can go. No, there's no monitoring per se, no, sir. But we, 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 can, we have the ability to be able to restrict which sites you can go to, and those are, uh, again, agreed by the government in conjunction with the Attorney General's office. Would you be able to say which parks have been installed into so far? Yeah, we have a we have a large number of parks that we there will be one park in every uh, constituency. I I have it right here. Just give me a second. <laughs> As you may be aware, I'm the member of parliament for Baines and Grantstown, so <laughs> we're number one on the list after, after Cal Allen Ramke and San Salvador, then uh, the deputy prime minister. But in the Baines and Grantstown area, we will be um, launching on what we call the virtual flip of the switch on at 2 p.m. It's the George Brown Park, which is located in Dumping Ground Corner. We have Bamboo Town, the Kennedy Park, that's also going to be flipping the switch at 3 p.m. Come, Michael, they, um, the park is called the Flamingo Gardens Park. 
and Cat Island, Rankings and Salvador, we have the no bite, no bite, sorry about that, uh, regatta site. Um, in Central and South Abaco, Spring City Community Park. In Central and South Elutra, the Governor's Harbor Park. Central, Government, Central Grand Bahama, Sunset Park. Um, just before you reach the, uh, the community of Hawksville. In Centerville, we'll be flipping the switch on Centerville Park at 12 noon. In East Grand Bahama, the McLean's Town Park. In Elizabeth Estates, the Elizabeth Estates Park, and they will, they will flip the switch at 2 p.m. on that particular day. The Angleston Park um, in Angleston. Exoma and Ragged Islands, we will be flipping the switch on the George, Georgetown Exoma Park. That's the first park, and that will start at 11 a.m. We expect that the Prime Minister will flip the switch at 10. And the next park to virtually flip the switch will be the Georgetown Exoma Park at 11 a.m. and all subsequent constituencies and members of parliament are expected to launch starting at 12 o'clock. Um, in Fox Hill, um, the two parks virtually um, physically connected, but we'll be flipping the switch on the Freedom Park at 2 p.m. and the subsequent, the adjacent park will also be flipped on at the same time. As a matter of fact, we'll be using the technology to ensure that we can advance the signal in both parks in Fox Hill. Um, in Freetown, um, Salem Park, it starts at 12. In Garden Hills, the Garden Hills Park, Park number one. In Golden Gates, uh, Sunshine Park number one, that starts at 12. In Golden Isles, it's, it would be the Bacardi Park, and the Minister Vaughn Miller will flip the switch at 12 o'clock. In Kalani, the Mount Pleasant Park, so we, we're looking to at least one park in each constituency, especially around what I indicated, the more densely populated area. In Long Island, we'll be doing, so it doesn't matter whether or not you have a PLP or FNMMP, if I could use that term, but we are looking to provide internet, free internet access through our Bahamas Connects project. Um, in Mangrove Key, so in Glinton's, in Long Island, we'll be switching the switch on the Glinton Park, Mangrove Key in Central Andres, uh, the Rodney Gibson Park in the Bluff. Um, in Marathon, the Lou Adley Park, that starts at 2. In Marco City, um, the Gladstone Moon Murphy Park, that park will be uh, flipped on at 12 noon. In Michael, um, the Machu Town Park, number 1. Mount Mariah, the Tom the Bird Grand Park in Yellow Elder. In Nassau Village, the Alexandria Boulevard Park, that's the main park in Nassau Village, and that starts at 12. In Naur Abaco, the Central Abaco Ball Park in Murphy Town. Naughty Lutra, the Gregory Town Regatta Site, Pine Ridge, the CA Smith Park, and Pine Wood would be the, the main Pinewood Park on Pinewood Boulevard. In Seabreeze, the Charles Carter Park, you know, we most, most of us may be familiar with that particular park, and that starts at 2 p.m. In South Beach, the Bougainvillea Park, park number one. Um, in Southern Shores, the Miller's Hyde Park, um, the, or the Percy Mullings Park. St. Anne's Step Street Park, St. Barnabas, um, Mother Pratt Park on 2nd Street, the Grove, and that, that switch will be flipped at 12 noon. And Tall Pines is we'll be flipping the switch at the Jubilee Park, West End Grand Bahama, the Jonestown Park, uh, West Grand Bahama and Bimini. We'll also be flipping the switch on the Bimini Baseball Park. And in Yamacraw, the Colony Village Park and Sun Glow Drive. We'll be flipping, virtually flipping the switch at 2 p.m. And as I indicated before, the Prime Minister will start the virtual flip of the switch the DPM at 10 a.m. The DPM will flip the switch at 11, and the other members of parliament and the various constituencies will start at 12, between 12 and 2. That was a long list. I don't know if you wanted the whole entire list, but <laughs> that was a long list. Yes, sir. You said there are going to be wardens at each park? Yeah, the, the, the government is seeking to ensure that we have park wardens to make sure that the park is safe and the environment is secure so that uh, the users of the park and the patrons could, could you know, be in a comfortable environment. 
Uh, you may not be too familiar with some of the parks, but the reality is we do have some challenges from time to time, especially with all the digital equipment that we're placing on the parks. We need to make certain that these digital equipment are secure as much as possible because they, you know, they could be used anywhere, you know, but we want to make certain that it remains on the park. Absolutely, absolutely. And where we where we are unable to build the exact um, the appropriate facility, we're going to place them in, in 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 a position that it can't be, you know, touched uh, naturally. Who's the main carrier? BTC or Cable Lines? It's a partnership. The part the project is actually the Ministry of Economic Affairs project, um, the digitization uh, and transformation area. So it's going to be one park, BDC on another Absolutely. park. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. We have segregated and divided the islands, um, as well as the Providence intersections, and we have given BTC and Cable Bahamas uh, their own uh, parks to, to provide the service. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I don't know if you mentioned it because I ran into the bathroom, but um, do you know how much all of this is going to cost? Are you able to? Well, there's, there's something in, in technology, it's called uh, management services, right? And so there'll be a monthly fee for the management and the maintenance of the service. And that particular fee uh, differs between Cable Bahamas and, and uh, BTC. But one thing is important for you to understand and appreciate that this is a social initiative and our partners are socially inclined to provide the service. In addition to that, I just think it's important for you to also remember that uh, in BTC as well as Cable Bahamas, government owned shares in all of these entities. So again, we're looking at it from a social perspective to ensure that we can provide the necessary services to the citizens and not be too concerned about the costs. Um, I mean, just what about like, you know, the cost to like set everything up? Because obviously you have to build the, the facilities mm -hmm. the policies, um, mm -hmm. the technology. Yeah, it, it, it varies between the two providers. It varies between the two providers, but the equipment, the, uh, the provisioning of uh, the energizer, which is BPL, as well as the uh, co telecommunications link, they differ depending on um, what is necessary at each particular park. In some parks, we didn't have fiber connection. In some parks, we didn't have internet connection. So we had to bring fiber and we had to bring internet into some of these parks. In other parks, we, we had uh, fiber strands or uh, uh, telecommunication strands running in the area. So we didn't have to factor that cost in. So that's why I said it varies according to the park. And it depends on the service provider. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, so BDC and Cuba Bombers, they're going to hire their own wardens or the government's going to hire the wardens? No, the, gov the wardens are hired by the government. It's expected that the, gov the government will hire the wardens, okay. not, not, not the service providers. Thank you. Good. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. no so, um, Mr. Um, she just asked about cost. So what, what is an estimated cost? I mean, overall, period. We talk about wardens and we talk about... Uh, the, uh, what is the estimated? No, I, I think it's important for you, uh, for the media to understand that it's a social initiative. You follow me? And, and then I think it's also important for, you, for the media to understand that BTC as well as Cable Bahamas as well as BPL, uh, quote unquote, uh, so the so government has share, shares in all of these entities. So the cost is, it's not a commercial cost. I don't want to quote any figures because I don't want to be incorrect, but it's negligible compared to, um, you know, yes, absolutely. So I, I don't want to give you any numbers out front like that. And again, as I indicated, the cost provided for some services by BPL, versus, not BPL, by BTC versus Cable Bahamas differs because the infrastructure in the various area, in the various parks differ accordingly, you see? So I don't want to quote any numbers, if that's okay with you. One more question. <coughs> Excuse me. While you don't want to quote any numbers, the persons you said that you would be hiring wardens for each park, and there are numerous parks throughout the entire country, mm -hmm. will these persons be already engaged in the government service, or will they be new hires? The, the cabinet will make a determination as to how we will retrofit these parks with, 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 with wardens. Uh, we do have persons who work for the government right now that we can 
shift, as well as the government and the cabinet has the opportunity to determine whether or not. If, 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 if you could recall, uh, specifically, we do have some, what you call it, uh, the pandemic, the pandemic offices. The COVID offices. Yeah, COVID, COVID offices. So we're now looking to see how we can you know, use them in a different capacity. So, you know, again, those decisions would be made directly by the cabinet. Okay, wow. We, we just need to you know, know, and it would be good if we, you know, we employ more people. But we will, we will disclose all the figures again. You know, I have to rely on the cabinet to release those numbers. Yeah, no problem. And just to supplement what the parliamentary secretary has said, um, we do have a program in place. You have a plan in place now uh, where there are some wardens at various parks now. There are people who are employed as wardens in some parks. Some parks have wardens. Um, there's a program in place to see, to do an assessment as to which park needs wardens, and whether those persons will be new hires or be deployed from other areas. Um, and all of those have been allocated in, in the budget that has been approved. Uh, so any kind of hire will be in, in, in line with whatever ministry um, has allocation for new hires. Um, but that will be determined as a program is effectively launched. Um, we will get back to you on the costing. I think it's important for you to know how much is this project going to cost? That's important. So we will commit to get back to you on the cost uh, to implement such an undertaking for you. We'll get back to you with that as well. All right. And finally, this morning, I want to invite Ms. Christine DeNorm. She's a vice president of MacFam. Uh, family is very important to the Davis administration. Prime Minister has spoken about it. He believes strong families make stronger communities. Uh, and so we want to endorse uh, Fa National Family Week. So I'm going to ask Christine DeNorm to come real quick and talk, touch a, a bit on that. And then I'll take all of your questions that you may have additionally and give you some announcements as well. Christina. Thank you, Mr. Watson. He said brief. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, I want to start out by saying, listing five words, harmonious, abundant, productive, progressive, yes about. If we take the first letter of each of those words and put those together, what do we get? Ha happy. So a very happy morning, honorable parliamentary members and members of the press. My name is Christina Nenorm. VP of Marriage, Children, Family Alliance Movement, or for short, MC Farm, the nonprofit arm of National Organization Development Connections International, a social consultancy enterprise and organizers of the activities and event to be announced. I wish to first offer apologies for Dr. Jacinta Higgs, former director of Gender and Family Affairs, and now Assistant Treasurer of the Civil Society Bahamas, a partner in the Bahamas Strong Families Forever campaign, who is actually scheduled to make this presentation, and also the absence of Ms. Cheryl Joaquin Alexander. She is the Principal Organizational Development Consultant of Nord Connections, and the founder and president of MC Farm who is unfortunately in quarantine. In collaboration with the Ministry of Social Services and Urban Development, the, gender, the Department of Gender and Family Affairs, other aligned departments and non-governmental partners, two of whom are here, Ms. Erin Brown of Erin Brown Connects and Ms. Stephanie Frith of the Princess Court Ministries. We are excited to announce the second annual National Family Week, which is July 25th through 31st, under the theme, Family Focus, Our Generational Promise. The occasion parachutes the Bahamas Strong Families Forever campaign, which will, path, which will be the path of the 50th anniversary of the Bahamas 2023, the road to the United Nations International Day of Families, 30th anniversary 2024, and ultimately the journey to achievement of our global sustainable development goals, 2030. In keeping with the mandate of this year's proclamation, which states, and whereas National Family Week is celebrated annually in many countries around the world, and provides a space to highlight issues confronting the family and opportunities to strengthen 
family bonds and capacities, and whereas we are encouraged to strengthen policies, programs, and activities within the government and private sector agencies that support and build the improved inherent functioning of families. We are happy to share with you a number of planned NFW, National Family Week, activities. We will preface the week of the activities with attendance at the church, at a church service at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints this Sunday, the 24th of July, 2022 at 9.45 a.m. to 10.45 a.m. We invite all to attend. There is limited seating, but we want to pray for blessings on the week's on the week's activities and on families of our beloved Bahamas. The highlight of National Family Week will be a two-day family policy and training symposium, which is Wednesday and Thursday, the 27th and the 28th of July. The key lead presenter will be Tim Rurick, Dr. Tim Rurick, marriage and family professor and author, and a multiple time UN presenter. The training aims to provide insight for government, business and multi-sectorial leaders in building a family impact lens when designing and assessing policies and programs to migrate, mitigate against social, cultural and economic breakdown. Other presenters will be Barrington Brennan, marriage and family therapist, Rochelle Newbold of the SDG Unit, Office of the Prime Minister, Pastor David Burrows of BFM, Erin Brown, Disabilities Inclusion Advocate, and Cheryl Joaquin Alexander, the Nord Connection of Nord Connections, Calissa Simmons, National Parenting Program, Dr. Calais Philippe, Ministry of Health, former Director of Gender and Family Affairs. So just to highlight some of the events that we'll be having this coming week. On Monday, we'll be making a number of courtesy calls with Dr. Tim Rurick, and we're also encouraging a family game night and movie night. Um, Tuesday, we'll be having courtesy calls on the cabinet as well with Dr. Tim Rurick. We will also be having a family photo competition, and that deadline is that same day at 5.59 a.m. Wednesday and Thursday is the training symposium, which will be at the Super Club's Breezes between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And Friday is spouse date night and t-shirt day. So spouses, couples out there, if you haven't you know, gotten a chance to go get out and actually have some fun together, we're encouraging you to use that night to do so. And Saturday, we have a fun day, a family fun day and t-shirt day as well. And Sunday, again, we want to encourage all churches to family Sunday. So everybody, we're encouraging everyone to go to church and pray to, pray to lead by, I guess, by men to pray at 3 p.m. We look forward to the participation of all as we join in cultivating happy, which is harmonious, abundant, progressive, productive, yesable families. And if you wish to connect with us, we have emails. Um, one, you could email nodc, that's N-O-D-C-I dot mcfam at gmail.com, or you can give a call at 393-2671. I would also like to welcome two of our partners, Ms. Erin Brown and Stephanie Frith, to briefly share why they decided to partner with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to stand before the press. Uh, my name is Minister Stephanie Frith. I am the President and Executive Director of Princess Court Ministries for Charlotte here in Nassau. We are also in Grand Bahama for now about 14 years, and I decided to bring it here. Princess Court Ministries is a mentoring program for girls ages 5 to 18. We encourage them to remain sexually pure before and after marriage, to become godly homemakers, enhance their spiritual lives. We um, train them anywhere from cooking to baking, braiding, 
even self-defense. Um, we recently partnered with um, Bahamas Strong Families Forever because we believe in the goal that they are doing, and we believe in children, all children being happy makes a happy adult. Minister Fred, thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Erin Brown, <clears throat> Disability Inclusion Consultant. I am a short, blonde-haired black female wearing blue-tinted glasses. My pronouns are she and her, and I self-identify as a limb difference individual, also known as an above-the-knee amputee. And with over 15% of the world's population living with a disability and growing every day due to race, accident, medical incident, or age, emergencies, and disaster, research states that one in four of us live with a disability or know a person with a disability. The family unit that comprise of a parent or a child with a disability experience diverse, unique, economic, and social hardships due to lack of inclusive resources and funding, inclusion in support and referral pathways and opportunities to be happy. Today, by supporting NORD and its Bahamas Strong Families Forever Campaign 2022-2023, we will empower our children with disabilities and their families to show up authentically. We will amplify the voices of adults and parents with disabilities to, and also to teach our community, public and private sectors the importance of becoming disability allies and how to implement inclusive and accessible spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, and I would encourage all of you to wear as much as possible participate and be involved in Family Week. Thank you for sharing that. We always believe it's important to talk about what our civic organizations are doing and how we can play a more meaningful role in society. So thank you, ladies, for your work, and we encourage those to be a part uh, who can support where you can support. Okay, let's get to the, any announcements and questions, and then our, our featured Food Business of the Week, which we're looking forward to. Um, I do have a statement from the chairman of the uh, DRA, uh, I think it's important for you, Disaster Reconstruction Authority, that is, uh, on a new initiative that's coming up. Um, a major priority for the government uh, is to rebuild communities devastated by Hurricane Dorian and to provide relief to those affected by the storm. Um, you're fully aware of the displacement and devastation caused by Hurricane Dorian and the fact that many families are restarting their lives. In this regard, the government, through the Department of Housing, is committed to commencing the construction of permanent homes in Abaco. Given this commitment, the government will be commencing the next phase of its building works on the Spring City site. The Department of Housing, in collaboration with the DRA, in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, allowed the temporary use of the Spring City Housing Development Site to erect domes for selected survivors. This new phase of the housing program will necessitate the closure of the Spring City Dome Site. A team, for, a, a team will be included, uh, which includes the Ministry of Transport and Housing, the Ministry of Social Services, the Disaster Reconstruction Authority, and the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit began conducting assessments of the dome occupants in February this year to understand the needs of the occupants and to ensure a seamless and smooth transition. Coming out of these assessments and conversations, the need for safe, clean, and adequate housing was reinforced, particularly as we entered the 2022 hurricane season. Representatives will hold individual meetings with each dome occupant next week to discuss their relocation plans and the assistance of the government that the government will provide in this process. DRA representatives from the Abaco office will begin contacting occupants to confirm the availability, meeting times, and locations. 
Our intent is to ensure that each family currently residing in the Spring City dorms is treated respectfully and given the appropriate assistance to normalize their living conditions. We assure those impacted that they will be treated fairly and with respect. We look forward to connecting with families and persons next week. That's on behalf of the chairman of the DRA, H. Alexander Store. And so those teams obviously will be meeting with people over the next few days next week uh, to ensure that their relocation process is seamless and smooth, and smooth as much as possible. All right, that's my announcement. Any questions on anything? Uh, let's begin with Yuri Kemp, the Tribune. Hey, Yuri. Uh, uh, yeah, good, good afternoon, Mr. Watson. Uh, do you think the government has a grip on the, the unions right now, considering everyone's uh, coming up and striking because the BUT is the next union to come up now wanting to strike from industrial action? Right. Um, it's not our job to have a grip on unions. It's our job to work with them. Um, they're not any creature that you need to get a grip on. Um, they're, they represent workers in this country who have serious concerns. Many of them are long outstanding. They need to be addressed. The government is working to see how best it can address them given its constraints. And so our focus is not to get a grip on them. Our focus is to meet with each one of them and see how best we can resolve the challenges. And that's what's going on right now. Uh, I know some people would like things to happen faster than they can happen. Uh, but nonetheless, it is to avoid any disruption to the service as we've seen earlier this week and to try and work through the situations. Again, I stress, many of these matters are outstanding, years outstanding. And so it takes some time to work through them and to bring resolution. That is Prime Minister Davis's focus, to bring resolution. He believes that they, they have rights, they have voices, they have concerns, they are to be respected, they are to be addressed. And that's what the government is looking at his resources, given how restrained they are and how constrained they are and how best we can utilize them and meet those needs. So our views of unions is not to restrain them or control them, but to see how best we can solve the issues that are presented by them. Do you think the administration is getting a fair shake, considering that it's only been less than a year that they've been in office? Many people may question that and say, well, it's not our problem. We don't govern that way. The government, this is the present government of the Bahamas. So any problems that, it, that, that, it, that, that is associated with past governments now become the, the, this present government's responsibility. We're not going to shrug it off and say, oh, it ain't our fault, we didn't cause that. No, we're going to find a way to solve and resolve. So we accept the responsibility of any outstanding issue. We accept the, uh, the, the responsibility to meet with them. We have teams who are working with these unions, and our focus is to bring resolution. It is our responsibility. This is the Davis administration. Prime Minister Davis is committed to adopting whatever matters are outstanding and seeing how best he can resolve them. All right. Uh, I don't see Nassau Guardian here, so let's go to, uh, I don't see our news here as well either. So, JCN. Hi, Kale. Uh, good day. Um, on the back of it as unions, uh, the bus drivers union are being dissatisfied with the relief package are not requesting to meet the Prime Minister. Would you be able to say if this was in the works or... No, we've not gotten any formal requests as yet that I am aware of. I stress that I am aware of. Um, Prime Minister Davis has no issue meeting with union leaders. He's done it before. He's, been, he's, he's made interventions recently with the uh, airport authority to get them back to work. And so Prime Minister is always available when there are pressing matters. If the minister prefers him to address a matter, it will happen. They have said, the minister said they have gone on record saying they don't want to meet with the minister, with the prime minister. We'll, we'll, we'll look at it and see how best we can address the issues. Listen, we recognize people have concerns, right? And, and, and unions will do what they do best. I, I was a part of the union for many years. You're going to try and see if you can represent your people. That is their job, and we accept that. Um, but what the government has to do is balance and see what's pressing, how best to address all of the issues, because when you address the issue of, of the buses you, buses, you also now create a greater burden for the people who ride the buses, right? If you're going to increase the fare, one thing affects the next. And that's what governance requires you to be able to ensure that whatever decision you make, it's in the best interest of all parties involved, particularly the people that you represent. So while we hear the cries of the buses union, we hear the cries of, of needing assistance, there are also has to be strategic planning to ensure that whatever decision you make impacts, it impacts everybody, and it's a right decision. Uh, but one thing we can guarantee you is resolution on, on, on their behalf. may not be everybody's satisfactory resolution, but there'll be resolution. All right? Uh, Carla Palmer said, and I say Carla. Um, talking about um, person, how many persons remain in terms of residents in Spring City right now? Um, and how many have to be relocated? Uh, there are a few, I get the number of numbers for you. I'm remembering carefully, I was told last time I think there were about 30 something, I think, 
of, of families that were still there, displaced. Uh, so those families have anywhere from from three to eight people involved in those families. But there, in total, there are about a hundred and some people. Okay, so construction of these new homes will begin when? And, 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 and to make it clear, we're not, cons we're, not, we're not constructing homes for people to move from, from the domes to homes. Uh, we're assisting in relocation. So it could mean in helping them find apartments. It could mean helping them find other housing. Uh, it's not moving you into a new house. It's helping you find housing. And the government will do that strategically with financial assistance as well. Uh, we've been working with these families so that it's not an uncomfortable move. But we want to get them out of the domes because we don't believe the domes in the hurricane season are safe. As you heard the stories running on the domes, there are concerns about them, uh, about the, uh, sanit the sanity of the domes, <laughs> sanitization of the domes. And so we, the idea is to move them into better housing condition that may be more long term. And so that's why they're going to have these meetings with the team members next week to decide whether that's an apartment, that's other housing housing, other rentals. It could be any number. Okay, and therein, what right now is the government's biggest challenge? Um, take your pick. <laughs> Take your pick. Uh, there are a number of things happening. Obviously, uh, coming on to the third anniversary of Dorian, you want to be able to, to get people stabilized on, in Grand Bahama and Abaco, um, get people in homes. The biggest challenge with Dorian uh, survivors uh, are, is housing. The biggest challenge of getting these islands back up and running is that people need places to live so they can begin business and so forth. So housing remains a critical challenge, getting people in, in living accommodations on these islands so they can begin to really see a resurgence of the, on these islands. That's on that front. Um, then there is, of course, uh, the opportunity of trying to ensure that we're able to keep the cost of living uh, uh, manageable for the Bahamian people. With rising fuel prices, we're glad to see that there's some relief on that front. You're going to hear an announcement real soon about relief at the ports that we're going to be making very soon with the cost of shipping coming down drastically, which we're excited about. Um, that's going to be made soon, and you'll hear more about that. So finding ways to ensure that the Bahamian people are able to manage and live during these difficult times always remains a challenge. I, I, I do want to say, though, because because uh, you don't hear people talk about unemployment, uh, unemployment a, a lot. If you look in the papers, if you look on, online, if you look around, you will see there are a lot of vacancies. People are looking for employment, are looking for workers. So I stress that people who need to work, look, take a look at what's around. I, it's, it's in abundance. Um, and and I, I almost reminds me as to whether we're going through the same thing America went through, where America now can't find enough people to go to work. There, I mean, you go to America, there are wanted signs everywhere, help wanted. Um, and and it's, it's becoming like that in the, in the Bahamas. People need workers. So I implore people who need to get back to work or who need to work, it might not be the ideal job you want, but it's an opportunity to make an income. And there are a lot of vacancies that are out there uh, that can help people get back on their feet. Um, and I think that helps the economy as well. So, so Carla, in, in, a, in a short form, um, dealing with the lives of Bahamians, that they can have a, a, a normal life, at least some level of normalcy, that's the priority of the Davis administration. And that's on a number of fronts. Uh, Eyewitness News, Leigh Cooper, hi Leigh. Give an update on how uh, I guess uh, the discussions are going with um, the um, petroleum dealers and um, the government. They're going. Um, um. The good news is not rising higher than we expected it to. They're going. It's trying to find the formula that to keep consumers happy. We're not rising. Uh, fuel costs, but also so that these operators can live. They have employees, they have businesses, they must survive. And we have to look, like, my soul, like I said with, with Kiel's question, we have to we have find a way to ensure that everybody is able to survive. It's a balancing act. And so those discussions continue to find what can you do for the retailers and petroleum dealers that you may be able to bring some level of relief to them without them having to raise their costs so they can still do business in the country and, 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 and be successful at it, but yet consumers can still be able to afford to put the go to the pumps and fill up their cars. So it's, it's still negotiating. And while I'm happy while they're negotiating, you're seeing at some locations certain reliefs. And I encourage the consumers Look out where you hear um, some dealers and distributors who are giving relief on gas and taking a bite. It depends. Different different stations are doing it for different shipments. Shop around 
and get those deals that are going around. But what you see happening is people are trying to find ways to make it work without just saying, too bad, let's just increase it. Uh, and those discussions continue. But while they're continuing, the talks are also happening to find relief for people. All right. Um, let's talk to Shelly Lewis, Global Radio. Hi, Shelly. Yes, hi. Thank you for um, okay. um, Final question. There seems to be a growing concern with regards to the acquisition of government owned crime land and behavior land, particularly in Abaco. There have been some videos circulating showing what's being done, what's happening in Abaco. What is the government's position? Because I recall Minister Says announcing that they would be demolishing illegal structures on government owned land. What is the status with regards to that? You know a task force was formed, uh, Minister of National Security, Wayne Monroe, came to one of our press conferences and talked about it. He had the entire task force here. Um, they are working. Um, sometimes things don't move as fast as we would like. And there's a number of reasons I've learned and I've had to be patient about it, even working in the public service. Because there are so many things you have to ensure that are, are in place first before you just move in. You don't just pick up tomorrow and say, get off Crown Land, knock your house down, find another place to live. It doesn't work that way. Because there are all sorts of uh, agreements with the United Nations to ensure the rights of people are respected, even if they're doing something that's not legal. Um, also, you, you have to make sure the legal, the legal parameters are in place so that when it goes to court, it's sound. Um, and so there are a lot of planning that has to take place before execution. They're in the planning stage, and they're about to move closer to the execution stage, and you see the results. Um, we are comfortable and confident as a government that the task force is addressing the matter correctly, and you will see the results of that, and they'll be addressed. You'll also find out that when that task force goes in and we begin to talk further, that things that appear what they are are actually not. And those who are involved are actually involved deeper than they would like to portray. One more mm -hmm. <coughs> Just this past week, Chairman of the um, Beaches and Parks and Kel Barney said that he would be addressing contra outstanding contra contracts as of next week. Many of the contract holders are saying that their contracts indicate that they've been from June 1st last year to June of this year. And that they, what, 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 what we need to know is whether or not the outstanding balance on those contracts will be considered because nothing is being mentioned with regards to the entirety of the contracts. Yeah, it's something that we're going to obviously to find out from the chairman of the authority and get back to you on. Um, we do need to resolve any outstanding matters. That is for sure. And we accept, and, and I, I, will, I will say that, that we have to get it done in a timely fashion. No Bahamian should have to wait for an inordinate amount of time to have resolution. And, and I, believe that, I believe that we ought to make sure that Bahamians are always first, regardless of, of their political affiliation, that we deal with people swiftly as, as much as we can, and as professionally as we can, and as accurately as we can. Now, we've heard from the chairman that there were some outstanding concerns as far as the verification process for some. They could not make final payments because they cannot verify that the accounts on file are the people who are claiming them. There are a number of concerns. That aside, there may be those who have been verified and are just waiting for settlement. We have to ensure that that happens quickly. I'll say that much. We have to ensure uh, that we are able to deal with this and put a closure on those who have been waiting. And hopefully, the uh, I, I believe the chairman and his authority understands the government's urgency in wanting to see this resolved. And so extra steam has been placed to make sure that resolution comes quick. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, uh, it's time for our, our food. Sure, Yuri. Just because it's you. Thank you so much. I know uh, we mentioned that uh, the pro-new deal is still working for the right. How does the government respond to people thinking that the government is waiting out the clock? For the oil prices to go back down before they actually give any relief to the petroleum dealers? It's not. It's not. I mean, we, you can talk to the petroleum dealers themselves, and they can tell you that the meetings that they've had have been productive. Mm -hmm. um, the government is working on their behalf. People will say all sorts of things. Okay. Um, but at the end of the day, the proof to what people say will be the results that we deliver on. Okay. 
One more prickly question. I know uh, third last, one? Yeah, I know last week uh, the Prime Minister was at a forum at the University of Bahamas, a national policy forum, and a, and a LGBTQ, LGBTQ activist jumped up and started making a bunch of accusations against the government. I was wondering, where does the administration stand homosexual marriage and homosexual rights in the Bahamas? The administration has never put out a position, and the Prime Minister addressed and said he governs all people, and we reiterate and stand behind that. His policies and his plans and his, his projections for the Bahamas are for all Bahamian people. Thank you, Ms. Welcome. Uh, our, our highlight today, I think today is a good day uh, for comfort food. Uh, and so I thought that one of the most outstanding businesses who have been really there for the Bahamian people, particularly those who have been trying to pinch those dollars, um, has been Little Caesars. And so I know we've been bringing all of these individual vendors. And so we're so happy to be able to bring a franchise who really has been looking out for the poor man. Uh, and I'm going to call Shakira McDonald uh, to come and talk about, we got pizza for y'all today, y'all. We got pizza for y'all. Come on, Shakira, and talk about Little Caesars real quick for us. Thank you so much, Clint. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, a sincere thank you to the Office of the Prime Minister for allowing Little Caesars Bahamas, which is a 100% Bahamian-owned company, to be here today and to share with you our most recent special offerings in addition to some of our truly delicious top sellers. These include our recently launched new stuffed crust pizza, a delicious pepperoni pizza that has a cheese stuffed crust brushed with garlic butter and sprinkled with Parmesan cheese. It is simply irresistible. I've bought for you as well a crowd pleaser, our four-in-one deluxe. So whether you're a vegetarian, you love lots of meat, or you enjoy both meat and veggies, we've got you covered. As our four and one deluxe pizza is a large pizza with two pepperoni slices, two three meat slices, three meat treats, sorry, slices, two ultimate supreme slices, and two veggie slices. It is truly something in there for everyone. As a reminder, all of our pizzas are served large, and we proudly say that we are your number one value leader. We invite you to check us out today at any of our four locations, Oaksville Shopping Plaza on Camichael Road across the street from BFM, East Street South in the Pineapple Plaza, or our newest location, our Charles Saunders Highway um, location. In closing, I would like to sincerely thank the thousands of our loyal customers. And guess what? I have some exciting news for you right here on the Office of the Prime Minister platform. We are about to open our fifth location in the Prince Charles, on Prince Charles, in the One East Plaza. So please feel free to check out our website and follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more information concerning our brand. Thank you, certainly been a pleasure. Awesome, so ladies and gentlemen, you're having pizza courtesy of the Office of the Prime Minister and Little Caesars today. That concludes our press conference. You know how to reach the Prime Minister's press office if you have any further questions. Good afternoon.